the Rock and Roll Unravel Show. I'm Derek Shelmerdine. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unravel Show. We're taking a look at one of the most influential people in rock and roll history. Guitarist, singer, songwriter, the legend that is Jimi Hendrix. Now to get us in the mood from the March of 1967, that's coming up to the Summer of Love, his second UK hit, it gave him a number three, and this is Jimi Hendrix with Purple Haze. Jimi Hendrix was born in Seattle, Washington on the 27th of November 1942. By mid-58 he was playing acoustic guitar with his first group, the Velvetones. His father bought him an electric guitar and by the middle of 1959 he joined the Rocking Kings. And on the 31st of May 1961, he joined the American Army. And after initial training, he joined a band of brothers, the 101st Airborne Division. Now, while he was stationed at Fort Campbell in Kentucky, he met bass player Billy Cox. And in the autumn, they formed the King Casuals. Well, his army career came to an end a year or so later when he broke his ankle in a parachute jump. Well, after the army, he relocated to Clarksville, Tennessee, and then on to Canada, where he joined Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. Now, the guitarist there was Tommy Chong. You know, he went on to form the very funny hippie group, Cheech and Chong. And Jimmy left the Vancouver's after he met Little Richard. And he went on tour with Little Richard, and he actually played on a handful of Little Richard tracks as well. But record collectors... Beware of bogus albums purporting to be Hendrix and Little Richard together. Um, a lot of those just are not the case. Now, he also recorded with Don Covey, the Isley Brothers, Rosalie Brooks, as well as touring with Jackie Wilson. And around the autumn of 65, he played very briefly with Joey D and the Starlighters, and then he was calling himself Jimmy James. Now, in June of 1964, the Isley Brothers released Testify, that's parts one and two, and that definitely did have Jimi Hendrix on guitar. It didn't trouble the charts on either side of the Atlantic. Now, Testify was actually released on the Isley Brothers' own label, T-Neck, so that's worth hunting down. And this is Jimi Hendrix with the Isley Brothers and Testify, part one. Well, Jimmy joined Curtis Knight and the Squires in the October of 1965 as their new lead guitarist. Now, Knight recorded at Studio 76, owned by a guy called Ed Chalpin, who was also Knight's manager. And Curtis Knight did uh, Jimi Hendrix the dubious courtesy of introducing him to Ed Chalpin. And, well, on the 15th of October 1965, he famously signed the management deal with... Ed Chalpin, a three-year exclusive recording agreement. Well, that really comes back to haunt Hendrix after he party company with Knight and Chalpin. Because when Ed Chalpin discovered that uh, Jimmy had found international success with his new manager, Chaz Chandler, Chalpin invoked the contract and claimed his share of the royalties. And the legal wrangles followed long after Jimmy Hendrix's death. Well, in the spring of 66, he formed his own band, Jimmy James and the Blue Flames, with Randy California, the guitar and vocals. Now, Randy California was actually born Randy Craig Wolf in L.A., California, and he picked up the nickname Randy California from this time with Hendrix because Jimmy had two Randys in the band, and he decided to avoid confusion. He'd given them both surnames taken from their home state, and the Randy California nickname stuck and he actually went on to found um, spirit now in mid-66 the animals were in america on their final tour they were in the process of splitting up Chaz chandler was the bass player and he wanted to get into artist management and he famously saw jimmy play at the cafe war in greenwich village new york on the 5th of july now jimmy james and the blue flames were the band that jimmy was calling himself at that particular time. And it was Linda Keith, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones girlfriend who introduced Chaz to Jimi Hendrix. And it was Linda that actually bought Hendrix's Fender Stratocaster. And shortly afterwards, Chaz Chandler signed Hendrix to a management deal 
but he completely ignored the contract that Jimmy already had with um, Ed Chalpin. He persuaded Jimmy to move to London. Now, in London, in the mid-60s, it was swinging London. And along with Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, the epicentre of the hippie universe at that time, they were the two coolest places on earth, without a doubt. Apparently, Jimi Hendrix asked Randy California to go with him to London, but Randy thought he was just a little bit too young for that particular gig. Well, by the end of September, they were on a plane for London. And on the 1st of October, Jimi Hendrix famously jammed with a cream at Central London Polytechnic. Chaz introduced him to Eric Clapton and Jimmy jammed on stage with cream. They played Killing Floor. That was a Howling Wolf single written by Howling Wolf in 1965. So now they were in London. Jimmy J I M M Y became Jimmy J I M I, and they went about to form a band. And what they were looking for was another power trio like Cream. And first on board was Noel Redding. He was from Folkestone in Kent, actually born on Christmas Day in 1945. He was a guitarist. He switched to bass to join the Jimi Hendrix experience. And then the drummer, well, Mitch Mitchell, came from Ealing in. West London. There was an urban legend that Ainsley Dunmar also was up for the gig, but he lost out on the toss of a, a coin. But other sources say he just turned down the opportunity to be in Jimi Hendrix's experience. He may have regretted that if that is the case. But before Jimi Hendrix, uh, Mitch Mitchell actually unsuccessfully auditioned for both The Who and The Artwoods. Well, it was the Middle of October when Jimmy signed with uh, Mike Jeffrey's Anim Limited. And Mike Jeffrey had previously managed the animals and Chaz Chandler was still under contract to him. So now Jimi Hendrix and the experience were managed jointly by Chaz Chandler and Mike Jeffrey. They gave their first public performance on the 13th of October, supporting French rock star Jolly Halliday in France. A very short tour of France. They opened in the Novelty Cinema in Evreux, near Paris, and the tour ended at the Paris Olympia just five days later. Well, time for some more music. Now, Hey Joe, Hendrix's first single, very interesting background. And it was Tim Rose's slower arrangement of Hey Joe that influenced the Hendrix version. Tim Rose released it as a single in the UK in May of 66. And on the label, it's credited as arranged and adapted by Tim Rose. More of that later. And this is Tim Rose with his version of Hey Joe, brackets, you shut your woman down. You're listening to Derek Shelmerdine with the Rock and Roll and Ravel Show. We're looking at the legend that is Jimi Hendrix. But before continuing with the story, there's an opportunity to win a signed copy of my book, Rock and Roll Unraveled. Now, every month in conjunction with the Rock and Roll Unraveled show, there's a simple question to answer the draw. For the current question, just check out the homepage on my website, rockandrollunraveled.com. That's two L's for Unraveled. Follow the link to the quiz at the top of the page. Now, rock and Roll Unravel tells a story of rock and roll from its roots to mid-1970s punk. A record collector magazine liked the book and their review described it as comprehensive and invaluable. Thank you very much, record collector. Well, good luck with the competition, but meanwhile, back at the plot. On the 23rd of October 1966, Jimi Hendrix Experience recorded their first single, Hey Joe, at the Delane Lee Studios in London. On the 25th of October... They gave their UK debut performance at Scotch of St. James Club in London. And a month later, they were introduced to the press at the Bag of Nails Club. Well, they released their first single, Hey Joe, coupled with Stone Free, on the 16th of December 1966. That's the UK release date. Hey Joe has a really interesting background. It probably started out as a traditional folk song, but it was copyrighted by US folk singer Billy Roberts in 1962. And on the original Polydor release, Jimi Hendrix took the songwriting credit himself, and it's listed as traditional, arranged Hendrix, but later Hendrix releases of Hey Joe actually do credit Billy Roberts as the writer. It was popularised by The Leaves, with their version on the Mira label, but they wrongly credited the writer as Dino Valenti. 
And I mentioned earlier, Tim Rose's slower arrangement in 1966 was the one that really influenced Jimi Hendrix. And interestingly enough, on Hendrix's US reprise release of the song, the songwriting credit went to D. Valenti. The song was released about six months later in America. The B-side was changed to 51st anniversary and it was released just six weeks before they made their legendary concert debut at the Monterey Pop Festival. It uh, didn't trouble the uh, Billboard Top 40 at all. In fact, Jimi Hendrix's experience only had one American hit in his lifetime and that was all along the Watchtower in the September of 1968 and that only got to number 20. Well, April saw the Jimi Hendrix experience on their first UK tour, headlined by the Walker Brothers, and also featured Cat Stevens and Engelbert Humperdinck. Now, Engelbert Humperdinck was someone your mum and dad used to listen to, and I mention him because on the 26th of January, his single Release Me entered the UK charts, and it spent six consecutive weeks at number one. And that kept Strawberry Fields forever from the Beatles at number two. And that broke their run of 11 consecutive number ones. Now, Lemmy was a roadie for the Jimi Hendrix experience around this time, and he was probably a roadie on this particular tour. Lemmy was a bass player and singer, and he was with Hawkwind until they sacked him. Uh, But uh, all was not lost because he went off and formed Motorhead. Now, it was the first night of that package tour with the Walker Brothers at Finsbury Park Astoria on the 31st of March that Jimi Hendrix set fire to his guitar for the first time. And it was appropriately enough during the rendition of their song Fire. Well, that's Fender Stratocaster that Hendrix set fire to that night, sold at auction by the Fame Bureau in 2008 for £280,000. Well, from his upcoming debut album, Are You Experienced? This is Fire from the Jimi Hendrix Experience. You're listening to Derek Shalmadine and the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show with a look at that rock and roll legend, Jimi Hendrix. Lots of the bands and artists I talk about in the show are actually out on tour right now. And to check out the latest tour information for right around the world, check out my website, rockandrollunravel.com. Remember, that's two L's for Unraveled. And at the top of the page, you'll see 1960s, 1970s artists touring now. So if you're looking for details, you'll find it all there. Well, back to the story. 12th of May 1967, they released their first UK album, Are You Experienced? And that was the first album to be released on the newly founded Track Records. Now, about a month later, they were making their American debut at the first Monterey International Pop Festival. Now, The Who and Jimi Hendrix appeared on the third day, and famously, both refused to follow the other on stage. They'd seen each other's stage shows, and the toss of the coin put the Who on first. And in a feedback-laden version of Wild Thing, Hendrix set fire to his guitar. He smashed it into the stage until it snapped through the neck into the audience. Now there's a piece of rock and roll memorabilia. Well, the Monkees were at the Monterey Pop Festival and they invited the experience to uh, support them on their American tour. And they opened for the Monkees for the first time on the 8th of July at Florida's Jacksonville Coliseum. Now, the audiences for the two acts couldn't have been more different. Your typical Monkees fan being a very young teenage girl. And Hendrix's performances were greeted with chants of We want the monkeys! We want the monkeys! All the way through their performance. And for Jimmy and the lads, the tour came to a premature end a week or so later on the 16th of July at Forest Hill Stadium in New York. Now, legend has it that the ultra-conservative Daughters of the American Revolution put pressure on the promoter to tone down Jimi Hendrix's stage act. And this myth came about from an article by Australian journalist Lillian Roxon, who was actually accompanying the tour. It was a tongue-in-cheek piece, and it was written to explain the sudden departure from 
the tour of the Jimi Hendrix experience. In reality, Hendrix had just had enough of the We Want the Monkeys chants and quit the tour, though they all remained on friendly terms with the monkeys. And the end of 1967 uh, saw them with their second UK album, Axis Bold of Love, going into the charts. That took them to number five. And on the 28th of June 1968, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell signed a new contract with Mike Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler. Although not long after this, Mike Jeffrey bought Chaz Chandler out. Where Jimi released his highly acclaimed third album, Electric Ladyland, in the October of 68. It was a double album and sported a sleeve adorned with a bevy of naked ladies. Now, one of the big differences with Electric Ladyland, it was no longer just a power trio, as with the first two albums. It featured a host of rock luminaries. Steve Winwood, Al Cooper and Dave Mason were there. And future Band of Gypsies drummer Buddy Miles was on the album. And very much it marked the end of the Jimi Hendrix experience. Uh, Chaz Chandler and Noel Redding both moved on around this time. Chaz Chandler really just became frustrated with all the constant retakes and he relinquished his management and sold him his share out to Mike Jeffrey. Noel Redding took a slightly different view. He formed his own band, Fat Mattress. He switched from bass back to guitar and a lot more vocals with his new band. And interestingly enough, the Fat Mattress opened for Jimi Hendrix on his upcoming U.S. tour, so Redding played in both bands. He played bass in The Experience um, and then guitar and vocals in Fat Mattress. And Fat Mattress's first album came out about a year later, in the summer of 69, simply called Fat Mattress. And from that album, this is Mr. Moonshine. Well, Jimmy in the Twilight Zone. On the 17th of November 1968, he played Yale's Woolsey Hall, and it's now said that uh, Jimi Hendrix haunts the place. Well, there you go. Well, a couple of months later, he made a legendary appearance on British TV, and that was on BBC's Happening for Lulu show. They started out playing uh, Hey Joe, and then during the guitar solo, he stopped playing and proclaimed that they were going to stop playing this rubbish, as he called it, and proceeded to dedicate a song to Cream. And he launched into a storming introduction of Sunshine of Your Love. Now, the programme went out live, and the impromptu change of plan ran the programme late. And just before finishing, Hendrix can be heard to say... We're being put off the air. 29th of June, the Jimi Hendrix Experience made their swan song. The trio headlined the final day of the three-day Denver Pop Festival at the Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. And in the August, of course, 1969, it was Woodstock. And Hendrix played the gig in a band he called Gypsy Sun and Rainbows. And that did include original drummer Mitch Mitchell. But uh, Billy Cox was now the bass player. If you remember, he was from the Army Days and uh, King Casuals. Now, following the outing as the Gypsy Sun and Rainbows, Jimi Hendrix decided he wanted to go back to being a power trio again. And they made their debut on the 31st of December at the Fillmore East. And now he was calling the band band of gypsies and the trio was obviously Hendrix, Billy Cox on bass and Buddy Miles was now the the drummer. He'd been a founding member of Electric Flag. Now the gig was recorded and released as the live album Band of Gypsies and Rolling Stone magazine held the gig as one of the 20 concerts that changed rock and roll. Wow. Now the previous contract with Ed Chalpin really came back to to bite him. The album royalties for Band of Gypsies went to former manager Chalpin and part settlement of the deal he'd signed with him on the 15th of October 1965. But Band of Gypsies lineup sadly was short-lived. They only played two gigs. The second and final appearance came well less than a month later basically 
at the Winter Festival for Peace, an anti-Vietnam War benefit gig at Madison Square Garden, and it was a complete contrast to the Fillmore East gig. After playing just two songs, Who Knows in Earth Blues, there was an altercation between Hendrix and a woman in the audience, and it resulted in Hendrix throwing his toys out the pram. He just cut the performance dead and stormed off the stage. 16th of April saw the last UK singles hit in Jimi Hendrix's lifetime. He got a number 37 with Crosstown Traffic. Now, following the demise of Band of Gypsies, Jimi Hendrix stayed with the Power Trio lineup and still with old army buddy bass Billy Cox. Uh, he went back with the original drummer Mitch Mitchell. And now they were back on the road and they were back to being called the Jimi Hendrix Experience. And they embarked on a US tour. And their first concert in America was on the 25th of April. And they opened at the Forum in Inglewood, California. The tour closed on the 1st of August in Hawaii at the Honolulu International Center. And that was the, the last ever appearance of Jimi Hendrix in America. He opened his own studios. Well, he opened them officially at the end of August. And that was the Electric Lady Studios in Greenwich Village, New York. And of course, he played the Isle of Wight on the 30th of August, 1970. I was there. It was awesome. And it was the last concert he played in the UK. He was there with the likes of John Byers, The Who, The Doors. It was an awesome weekend. From there, he headed off to Europe for concerts in Sweden, Denmark and Germany. And his last ever outing was on the 6th of September on the Isle of uh, Furman in Germany at the Open Air Love and Peace festival and the set included killing floor and if you remember right back to the beginning of the show what was probably his first public appearance in the uk he jammed with cream on the first of october 66 and they played killing floor then now the song was written by howling wolf and it was a b-side for him in 1965 and i thought it'd be great to hear the original version of killing floor and this is howling wolf on his return to Britain, Jimi Hendrix made his last ever appearance when he jammed with Eric Burden and War. And that was on the 16th of September 1970 at Ronnie Scott's Club in London. They played uh, Blues for Memphis Slim, that included Mother Earth, Tobacco Road. He also wrote his final song, The Story of Life. And sadly, Jimi Hendrix died on the 18th of September. He was just 27 years old. His girlfriend, Monica Daneman, found Hendrix unconscious and unable to wake him, called an ambulance. The ambulance crew took him to hospital, but doctors failed to revive him. The death certificate gave the cause of death, and I quote, inhalation of vomit, barbiturate intoxication, quinylbarbitone, insufficient evidence of circumstances, open verdict. And Mike Jeffrey, his manager, reckoned there was only $20,000 owing to the Hendrix estate. That's after being one of the hottest properties in rock and roll for four years. There is so much speculation surrounding Hendrix's death. Monica Daneman's story kept changing. She suggested she travelled in the ambulance with Hendrix. The paramedics said that she didn't. In fact, Eric Burden, who was one of the first on the scene... He said that Monica Daneman travelled with him to the hospital. It was also Eric that found the words to the story of life, and he thought it was a suicide note at first. And Hendrix, apparently, it's been reported, had massive amounts of red wine in his lungs and very little in his bloodstream, which is apparently consistent with waterboarding rather than drinking. But there's a lot of speculation that Mike Jeffrey was tied up in Hendrix's death somehow. Apparently Hendrix's contract was due to expire and Hendrix was keen to cancel his contract with Jeffrey. And it suggested that Jeffrey had taken out a $1 million insurance policy on Hendrix. The claim of murder actually is made in James Tappy Wright and Rod Weinberg's book, Rock Roadie. It's also been suggested that the FBI had Hendrix under 
surveillance. We'll never know the truth, I guess. Mike Jeffrey died in a mid-air collision over France in 1973 and Monica Daneman committed suicide in 1996. Well, on the 7th of November 1970, Voodoo Child entered the UK charts and that was his first UK hit after he died. It was number one for a week. In fact, it was Jimi Hendrix's only UK number one. Well, that's it. I've been Derek Shelmerdine. You've been listening to the Rock and Roll Unraveled Show and the story of a true rock and roll icon, Jimi Hendrix. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the show half as much as I have in putting it together. If you're into social media, check out Twitter. I'm at at RNR Unraveled and Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled. Remember, you can win a copy of the book. Simply go to my website homepage, rockandrollunraveled.com, and all these unravels have two L's, and click on the link to the competition, and I'll post the signed copy of the book to the lucky winner anywhere in the world. Good luck with the competition. Join me again next time for another look at a little piece of rock and roll unraveled. Now, to play us out from that third album, Electric Ladyland really mark the end of the golden age of the Jimi Hendrix experience. But this is Voodoo Child. Slight return. <laughs>